on the subject of why education is not uh, a political issue, you know, I'm just right off the bat, I'm going to say that the title would be more accurate if it, uh, if it were, why isn't it more of a political issue? Because it is indeed beginning to get some traction. And I will talk about that uh, a little later on. But the fact remains quite clearly that we have not only for these past few decades failed most Indian children in terms of providing them the basic education that we ought to have been, but that we are still far from being on the trajectory which would address the problem in the near future. So obviously lots more needs to be done. I have a simple premise uh, and the premise is this, that politicians are rational people. What this means is that if it paid for them electorally to focus on education issues, we'd all be jumping on it and would make it our number one priority. That's a fact of life that we need to face. That of all the issues that politicians deal with, this does not figure at the top in terms of bang for the buck, in terms of uh, electoral um, boost, in terms of focusing on this as an issue. But I will touch upon a little bit later about why that is changing and how that is changing. Mm -hmm. But we have indeed ceded ground to other stakeholders. We, by we, I mean politicians. There's a fairly long track record of judicial intervention going back to 1993 when uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, the case was Unikrishnan versus the state of Andhra Pradesh that citizens have a fundamental right to education. The RTE can be traced back to that kind of uh, intervention. Uh, then of course the 86th constitutional amendment 10 years ago, uh, and the draft bill which was circulated in 2005 but only in 2008 was the right to education bill put in and there's lots of demands now that that needs to be improved upon. It still doesn't plug all the loopholes. There are several issues that we can touch upon. One thing I want to touch upon is that of the many stakeholders that have leverage Teachers are, I, in my opinion, have disproportionate leverage. Teachers are important stakeholders, but my experience is that for politicians or for governments to actually deal effectively with teachers' lobbies is, um, is not easy because they in fact have disproportionate leverage not just on education issues but on politics as a whole. Teachers generally are organized. Teachers generally, uh, you know, if you look at the government investment in schools and teachers, uh, on the one hand you've got issues of, uh, of hardware like your infrastructure and facilities. On the other hand you have issues like teacher attendance. Now, individual feedback that you talked about, um, we can't even begin to discuss that unless you have teacher presence. You know, even with a ratio of 30 is to 1, which many schools have achieved today in my state for instance, I think we could do a, a heck of a lot more if the 30 is to 1 teacher ratio was, was uh, in fact the reality on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is something far worse because of teacher absenteeism. And the system that needs to change, you know, you're all aware of stories of government teachers getting paid uh, rather high salaries relative to prevalent salaries of other similar professionals in their uh, in the comparable markets and, and yet not being present and subcontracting their jobs to local youth. Now, in my experience, I've come across challenges not just with teachers but with other professionals also. For example, healthcare professionals. Now, we, for example, in the, in the, uh, we have lots of primary and secondary healthcare centers with uh, shortages of staff. And even when you can hire them, you can't get them to stay in rural postings. They constantly lobby to be in the state headquarters or to be in the cities. And the pro some of the proposals have been to decentralize this, to have the blocks actually recruit staff instead of having a statewide cadre. Again, because of the organized efforts of lobbies such as healthcare professionals, such as teachers, that is impossible. If, if, if I could have my way, I would not have a statewide cadre. I would, at, you know, at the most it should be a block level 
perhaps we should even decentralize it further to give panchayats the ability to hire their own teachers in their villages. Uh, but we aren't able to push, the, you know, you can argue about the desirability of that or the lack of desirability of that, but that's a moot point because the political system is not able to deal with organized teachers' lobbies to push through this, uh, these ideas. You know, when you talk about other stakeholders uh, and you sp use a phrase like the unspoken club, the stakeholders that get worst affected, that are the least spoken, are the students. I mean, first of all, they are not voters, most of them. And secondly, they are not in a position to exercise any kind of leverage. And it, when, when it comes to their parents, the most vocal and the most demanding of the parents are, of course, middle class parents. And the broader issue that I have often talked about is uh, middle class apathy about politics. Now, we can, that's a whole subject by itself. We can go into that at great length. But... Uh, the, uh, the middle class has a lower voter turnout ratio in India than in virtually any other country, certainly compared to developing, uh, developed countries. And the middle class has options. Uh, it, it has private options available to it. Uh, we've seen this in higher education for 30 or 40 years as government has abdicated its responsibility. The vacuum in higher education has been filled up by for-profit higher education institutions and the middle class has that option both in higher education as well as in primary and secondary education. But the real revolution that's happening is that the private option is willy-nilly becoming available to uh, people who are not yet middle class and people who are not urban. Now I for example see lots of uh, mushrooming of private educational institutes and my sort of empirical experience is that they do remarkably well even though they are they, they don't stand any comparison to government or municipal facilities school facilities in terms of infrastructure uh, in terms of the pay levels of teachers they do remarkably well when it comes to the poorer sections of society I think we have baggage from many decades of India being such a poor country that basics of uh, food availability, basics of roti, kapda, makan, uh, used to completely outweigh any other consideration, such as education. But I clearly see that changing. I spend about 14 days a month in my constituency, among my constituents, and I clearly see that changing. I clearly see people, uh, and, and part of the reason is that there is, in fact, an improvement in the living standards of people, even in rural Odisha. Now, Odisha has for long been, you know, either the poorest or the second poorest state. And I think it is emblematic of what is happening, that we still obviously have lots of poverty. But even in my 12 years of experience, forget about the statistics given by the Planning Commission, we can argue about that. In my 12 years of being in Parliament, I see in the villages a noticeable difference in the standard of living. By no means are these people no longer poor. They continue to be poor. But the level of uh, desperation is, is uh, distinctly less today. And I think when, once you start meeting those basic requirements, uh, then issues like education and health start bubbling up to the surface as issues that matter. And I want to uh, cite two examples of how it is beginning to have an influence in politics. My own example, first of all, is that, uh, you know, we get an MP's local area development fund, which we are allowed to allocate based on our preferences, but we can only allocate it for hardware, for infrastructure. And uh, I have committed to spending at least 60% of that on education. So at least 60%, sometimes as much as 70, 75% of my MP's local area fund money goes to schools. And again, I've got sub-criteria uh, because I can only spend it on infrastructure. The government schools which are funded by SSA, in fact, have had quite a bit of improvement in their infrastructure in the last decade. And so I prioritize those schools which are not able to access funds for their infrastructure. And I want to make it clear that infrastructure is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. 
it by itself doesn't solve the problem. All these government schools that have had lots of SSA money come in over the last 8-10 years and who all have much better facilities today compared to 10 years ago still have those awful teacher attendance issues and not all that much improvement in uh, student performance. But as I said, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. You can't, you can't skip ahead and say, all right, let's have students sitting under trees and only focus on that aspect of things. You do need to do both. Uh, so my focus is to fund both government as well as private schools which don't have access to money. So among the government schools, you have something called the block grant schools which uh, have got some initial help and uh, they pay some teachers lower level of salary, but they have, without fail, uh, very poor infrastructure. And I focused on them and I focused on private schools that have come up. Now these schools pay something like 20% of the salary to their teachers compared to what the government schools pay. And these schools have very little infrastructure in terms of you know, most of them don't have a playing yard. Uh, they have uh, uh, smaller classrooms, sometimes on rent rather than owning them themselves. But they have two things that are remarkable about them. They have a very, very high degree of parent involvement. And I'm not talking about middle class parents. I'm talking about poor people, including daily wages, much more involved. And these are people that are voting with their feet. They're choosing to send their children to schools where they have to pay 50 rupees a month or sometimes um, even less than that, sometimes 25, 30 rupees a month as opposed to going to the government school which is free. And uh, the second thing that's remarkable about them is uh, the, the involvement of the teachers. Uh, you know, I see a very distinct difference when I interact with these teachers who get paid literally a pittance. And this, uh, you know, the proof of the pudding is that the results are dramatically better. The children's results are dramatically better. Uh, so these are the kind of school, schools that I help, as I said, both in the government, in the block grant, and in the private sector. And initially I had a lot of resistance because political party workers uh, don't treat schools as a particular um, priority. So they always, the pressure that I face from my party, from my party workers, is for other kinds of projects. Uh, projects where they can uh, be the contractor and maybe make a little money. So it's not a popular thing to do, to divert this to schools rather than to uh, build roads which can disappear every year and rebuild every year. But I've found that once you get traction, once you start getting support from families, from parents and from all the stakeholders who are involved in these kinds of schools, their support is adequate to resist these populist or, or political pressures that I face at the grassroots level. So uh, after several years of doing this, uh, it's become clearly established. Nobody asks me for money to, to allocate from my LAD funds for roads or for other kinds of things. I do allocate some money for... Uh, um, um, projects other than schools, uh, but as I said, about 60 to 75 percent of my money goes for uh, schools. So I think with a little degree of persistence, if you can get that traction from uh, your voters, you can resist the populist pressures at the grassroots level. But at the policy level, at the state level, the state government level, it's not easy because of the organized teacher strength. Uh, just you, if some of you followed news from eastern India, you'd have seen there were protests and strikes by teachers in Bhubaneswar the other day. There was a lati charge to control them. Uh, it's not easy for government to resist that kind of pressure. Uh, so, you know, we need to figure out ways and means of uh, how to deal with that. I want to say one more thing before I conclude. And the one other thing is that it is not just individual MPs like me who are discovering that focusing on education can pay electorally. Now, I wasn't sure it would pay electorally. I started doing it because it was the right thing to do. But I'm discovering more and more that it does pay electorally. In terms of the political support that I have, uh, it has improved in my constituency compared to when I got elected four years ago. But governments are discovering this, regional governments. Uh, Odisha government, Bihar government, some of these other governments have started spending innovatively 
Now, you had midday meal schemes with various degrees of success in keeping students in school. But you've start, got many other schemes such as bicycles for girl students, such as hostels for tribal students. And these are areas where I'm, where I'm beginning to see, just in the last five years, uh, governments changing direction. Still not significantly enough. You know, it's not like 60, 70, 80 percent of the budget has changed into that direction. It hasn't. But it is changing significantly enough. Odisha has built uh, hostels for one lakh tribal students. 25 percent of our population is tribal. And the averages are dragged, our, our attendance averages, school graduation averages, all these norms are dragged hugely down by the poor performance among the tribal population. And we have tried to change this around and focused on these one lakh capacity uh, hostels for tribal students. I wouldn't say that they're all flawless, they have their problems, but by and large, they are beginning to serve a purpose of keeping tribal children in school. And let me tell you what, um, it is paying off electorally. My party did not have a strong base among tribal voters. We've been in power today for uh, nearly 13 years, but up until about six years ago, we, we used to have relatively poorer results among the tribal districts of Odisha. And that started changing dramatically. In the last election, uh, we did sort of rather stunningly well in tribal districts, which were historically considered as vote banks for the two major national parties. So the point I'm trying to make is uh, don't appeal to politicians' uh, sense of doing the right thing. Appeal to politicians' sense of how it pays for them. Okay? And the final thing I want to say is, events like this are important. And what is even more important is to take this message right down to the voters, to demand. It's only when voters start demanding that politicians start listening. I mean, some politicians will come and listen to us here and, you know, say the right things and go away. But they will not focus on it unless it matters to them. And it matters to them when, voter, when it matters to voters. So the more awareness campaigns that we can have uh, to get rural voters particularly, that's where the real problem lies, to demand better, I think we're going to get results. Thank you.